Um, I'm an editor. I talk a lot about storytelling on my channel. And the whole project started because about a year and a half ago, I did a film with director Mark Weber, and it's the third film that we did together. And I suggested to him that we should put the editing process online on a YouTube channel so that we can talk about create, creative storytelling and what it takes to cut a scene. He was open to the idea, and a year and a half later now, actually the film, it just it premiered at South by Southwest a few months ago, and it's now actually coming to LA to screen, I think it's October 27th. Um, it'll be in theaters. Um, so what I was gonna do is, I was just gonna play a mini trailer of the channel to give you an idea of what some of these episodes look like. Hello there, and welcome to another episode of This Guy Edits, where you get to see this guy edit. Today I'm gonna talk a little bit about the relationship between the director and the editor. Action. As you might know from early episodes, I'm currently cutting a feature directed by Mark Weber. He just finished shooting it in Pennsylvania, and I'm now here in Los Angeles doing the first cut. Yeah, that's gonna work fine. I'm gonna put that in for now. It was commissary before we took off. And I know. So, yeah, I probably want another reaction shot of her. You should always ask yourself three questions when you tackle a scene. Who wants what? Why right now? And what happens if he doesn't get it? What's your take on the editing process as a director? I love writing. I love shooting. I love acting. But I really love this part. You're going to get a thousand little things that people want to fix or address and most of the time they are contradicting and you, you can never you can never make it the perfect movie anyways even though this kind of the end of flesh and blood uh, you should still subscribe because there are new things coming up Okay, so that gives you a little bit of an idea of what the channel was. Thank you. Um, and what I was going to do today is I wanted to talk a little bit about the importance of editing as part of storytelling, not just for editors. Um, that we're really sort of on the cusp of editing becoming something more than what it is today, I think. And the reason why I think so that that's the case is because of the new medium that we're facing. And I recently had a conversation with one of the reps of the editing softwares. We were having this discussion that I'm sure you've heard before, like is your software built for pro editors or is it built for everybody? And his answer stumped me because he said, we're actually not really interested in the pro editor or the regular editor. What we're looking for is to build a software for visual artists. And that means that it's not just editing, it's everything. It's really how you tell a story with this new medium. And we're trying to build a platform that will enable you to do everything, which is not just editing, it's doing your website, doing your social media presence, doing your graphic works, everything that you need to do to tell your story, not just the story of your film, but the story of you, you as a brand. And that really sort of inspired this talk that I gave just a few weeks ago, actually, at a, at a film school that I, I was teaching to the students to really make them become aware that, yes, you want to be a filmmaker, but you're going out there and there's so much more opportunities for you out there um, as a storyteller. And editing is a crucial part in the audiovisual medium. So I, I want to encourage the students, and not everybody in, in those classes are editors, I want to encourage them to be editing. And to be editing to tell stories. And that's sort of what the channel is also about. It's, it's not the tech side, I talk very little about how to how to fix a problem or how to use the software. I'm using the software as a tool to tell stories and what are the important parts to make scenes work. Um, I wanted to play 
uh, another clip. This is an episode that I just recently posted because since since the movie's launch were done, the, the channel is evolving. And this is a clip that shows what are three common mistakes that every beginner, to, beginner editors make. And this may be a little like uh, beginner stuff for you, but it's also you should maybe watch it and just look at the storytelling as well, how this is being told. In this tutorial, I'll cover three mistakes that almost all beginner editors make, and I don't mean this. I'm familiar with these mistakes because I was once guilty of making them too. A common mistake when you start editing is cutting too early. It is important to know a fair amount about your available footage before you make your first cut. And that's probably the nicest looking footage we have. If you don't know what you have and what's good, you run the risk of editing yourself into a corner. So find all the gold and uncover it first. Don't just watch the footage. Your brain can't hold onto these fleeting shots unless you work with them. This process is called selecting, and that can be different for every editor. Some take handwritten notes as they watch the footage, others build extensive select reels, and yet there are some that dance to it. I don't know if that works, but maybe I should try that. Just highlight. Whatever your process, important is that you actively work with the material. Five moments that I like. Because once you start editing, you want to have all these shots readily available to you so that the magic happens. Oh. Rookies usually don't use split edits, also called J and L cuts. Notice how the dialogue starts right as we cut to the actor's face. I was so lonely until now. So you think I'm that right lady? Maybe. Do you think I'm the ideal man? I haven't told you the truth, though. I knew it. That makes for a choppy and awkward cut. Now let's take the scene and let the dialogue pre-lap the visual. I am just going to roll back the video. Suddenly, it's as if the cut seems to disappear. Let's see if I'm right. I haven't told you the truth, though. I knew it. I demonstrated J or L cutting in a recent video. The key is to understand the purpose and meaning of the conversation to decide whether a split edit is appropriate. Michael Grabowski tells his students that they are simulating a third person watching a conversation take place. The cut is the person turning their head to see and hear the other person talking. There is another girl. No, that is not true. Sometimes someone starts to talk unexpectedly or quickly and we hear the voice before we have a chance to turn our head to see the person. That's the split edit. There is another girl. No, that is not true. Perfect. Now this doesn't feel awkward. I wanted to know what you think are some of the most common rookie mistakes. And the number one response, having no or a very chaotic workflow. That includes file and media management, bin organization, correct sequence and compression settings, outputting, all that mumbo jumbo. I've been editing for a while now and I barely managed to maintain a decent workflow. And these are all the different shoots. For example, I recently ingested my footage and immediately started selecting. Then I realized, oh, this is a multi-camera shoot. Wouldn't it be better to group all the clips together? I basically had to start over and lost a couple of hours of work. So here's my advice. Test your workflow all the way through the chain. Take a couple of shots, import them, sync the audio, test build a multicam, put them in different bins, cut a select reel, use a little storytelling to actually try to cut a mini scene that simulates the real project. Then do color and sound and go all the way to the end product, like a Blu-ray or a DCP, so that you catch any snacks. Along the way, document your workflow. That hour of testing can save you days of work that needs to be redone. Recap. Don't start your edit until you know your footage. Use split edits appropriately to simulate an organic flow of a scene. Know and test your workflow before you get in too deep. Like I said, you guys brought up a whole array of rookie mistakes and I sorted them into five categories. If you would like to go through them, I leave yet another link in the video description. If you liked this video, please click like and subscribe. If you didn't like this video, please click like and subscribe. I'll see you on the next one. Thanks for watching. Thank you. Um, has anybody seen Fateful Findings by Neil Breen? I would highly recommend that film. It's a, it's a film so good you want to hug it. Um, so it, 
this is this is a tutorial, obviously, but it's we're living in a different world, so it has a different kind of sensibility or storytelling, which I'm starting to realize on YouTube. This, the way you tell stories is, is different, and you have to there's this instant gratification, this need for instant gratification, and just having everything paid off. And it's it's a fun medium to play with, but it also can have an effect on how you're going to tell stories in other mediums, which I'm realizing now as I'm cutting a feature right now, I'm, I'm starting to use a lot of these techniques where you are just mixing and matching things up and, and jumping around. Um, so it's a fun experience for me as a storyteller to play with and to um, find new ways to tell interesting stories. Um, so that's one thing that I wanted to point out, that this new medium really is a possibility for you to experiment with storytelling and to do a lot of work. And that's really the key thing. Does anybody know who Casey Neistat is? He's a, probably one of the most well-known vloggers on YouTube. And he was a filmmaker first. And when I looked at his video library on YouTube, he has about 710 videos that he made. So it's a tremendous body of work that he's created within one or two years. And it really shows how you as a filmmaker, and he's a filmmaker first, so every episode he tells a story. It's not just his life and he's talking to a camera. He really looks at his day to day and says, how can I turn that into a piece of entertainment? And by doing that 720 times, he's perfecting his storytelling skills. And it's amazing how his generation and even the generation younger than him are using this medium and are practicing storytelling on a weekly basis. Um, one of the reasons why I got paid attention to this is actually that my daughter, who now is in high school, she started in elementary school having a YouTube channel about My Little Ponies. And she was popping out a video every twice a week. And she has 500 videos that she made. And within, within a month, I recommended to her to switch from iMovie to Final Cut Pro 10 because it's going to pay off for her in the long run because there's so many things that she's already wanting to do and she was pushing the limitations of the software. And so within, within a few months, she was fluent in Final Cut 10 and has an education as a filmmaker that is far beyond what I had when I graduated from AFI, um, just by doing it on a daily basis. And that's really, that's really one of the reasons why YouTube should be interesting to every filmmaker, because it's, it's a way to practice your craft. Um, I want to talk a little bit about my journey. And I want to start off by bringing up a still. I want to see if you guys recognize the movie. What is it? Yes. Very good. Different audience. When I showed this to my students, they were just blank stares. <laughs> Um, Dead Poets Society was the reason why I became a filmmaker. I, I lived in South Africa for a while because my dad was working there. And a different culture, I felt very alienated as a German. There, went to the movies, that became my escape, and I saw that movie, and I got inspired. And the reason why that is, is because it really is an inspirational movie, for one, but there's some messages in there that I think really apply even today. Uh, one is by the teacher, Robin Williams, who said, no matter what anyone tells you, words and ideas can change the world. Um, and another thing he said is, we don't read and write poetry because it's cute. We read and write poetry because we're members of the human race. And the human race is filled with passion. And I feel like nowadays filmmakers are our poets today. And that's the reason why they're telling stories. It's because they're filled with passion. And I wanted to become a filmmaker because of that, because I felt like having the ability to tell a story and connect to an audience is incredible, if you get that feedback. And that's how I set off, off on a journey and um, eventually ended up here in Los Angeles. And when I graduated from AFI, um, it's again the new medium. Um, I, 
a friend of mine asked me if I wanted to produce, I was studying producing, asked me if I wanted to produce this movie. I didn't want to, but I was interested in doing a webcast about the movie. And we did a live webcast from the set, so using the new medium to tell that story. And because of that, I sort of started getting into editing because I was using Final Cut, the first version, to cut these little packages that then we would blast online. And this is way before YouTube. Um, and because of that, um, I eventually got a call from James Cameron's little brother, Dave Cameron, who asked me if I wanted to do that for James Cameron's next movie, and they hired me to build a prototype of that. There was actually some 360 in there as well. We experimented with how can you actually tell a story with 360 cameras. This was like in 2000. And um, eventually I became an editor on his film, which was uh, Ghost of the Abyss, a 3D IMAX film, and that sort of put me on the path of becoming an editor. But I was very fortunate to be in a position where I could really look at it from a storytelling point of view and immediately um, get that positive feedback that I could be confident about telling stories and, um, and that it's okay for me to try something out. Um, so it was a very, very uh, beneficial mentorship that was sort of not even, I don't think he ever realized that he was a mentor to me. Um, after that, I, I made two movies, and they both sucked. They were terrible. Uh, one was in theaters, and I got a horrible review at the New York Times. Completely killed the movie. It's called L.A. Twister. Um, and then I realized, wow, this is not easy at all. Like, storytelling is, a, is something that you would think is so easy, because you all love a Scorsese movie. You all love how Chris, Christopher Nolan is doing something. You understand when you see a good movie, but then to apply it and turn your art into something that the audience responds to is a whole different story. And I wish I would have known something that Ira Glass shared uh, a while back. Ira Glass is from This American Life on NPR. And he did a little, I, I think he probably mentioned that on one of his shows, but they turned it into a video essay on what's it like to be creative. Nobody uh, tells people who are beginners, and I really wish somebody had told this to me, is that um, all of us who do creative work, like, you know, we get into it, and we get into it because we have good taste. But it's like there's a gap that for the first couple of years that you're making stuff, what you're making isn't so good, okay? It's not that great. It's, it's, it's trying to be good. It has ambition to be good, but it's not quite that good. But your taste, the thing that got you into the game, your, your taste is still killer. And your taste is good enough that you can tell that what you're making is kind of a disappointment to you. You know what I mean? A lot of people never get past that phase. A lot of people at that point, they quit. And the thing I, I would just like say to you with all my heart is that m most everybody I know who does interesting creative work they went through a phase of years where they had really good taste, they could tell what they were making wasn't as good as they wanted it to be. They knew it felt short. It didn't have this special thing that we wanted it to have. And the thing I would say to you is everybody goes through that. And for you to go through it, if you're going through it right now, if you're just getting out of that phase, you got to know it's totally normal. And the most important possible thing you could do is do a lot of work. Do a huge volume of work. Put yourself on a deadline so that every week or every month you know you're going to finish one story. Because it's only by actually going through a volume of work that you're actually going to ca catch up and close that gap. And your, the work you're making will be as good as your ambitions. In my case, like I, I took longer to figure out how to do this than anybody I've ever met. It takes a while. It's going to take you a while. It's normal to take a while. And you just have to fight your way through that. Okay. Thank you, Ira. I wish I would have known this when I started. I didn't. Um, so there's this recurring theme that you have to do a lot of work to be able to get your skill level up to what your taste level is. And um, that's really what I wanted to always share with my students as well, is there's this, as soon as you put out a, a movie or a project and you get rejection, and you will, when you do it at the at first, 
um, it can really stop you in your growth. And you need to overcome that fear as a storyteller. You need to just say, okay, great. Um, that sucked. Let's do it again. Let's try and f fail harder. And again, this medium, YouTube, is perfect for that because every week or every video that you upload, you get another chance to um, get that experience of, wow, that really sucked. And then you gradually improve upon that and hopefully eventually it will get better. Um, so that's a takeaway. Um, the opportunities are plentif plentiful and unexpected. The other thing I wanted to point out is that in my, my journey as an editor, um, at some point, I, at the beginning, I was always looking for personal challenges, like, oh, this is really cool, I want to do that, I want to do a webcast on a set, oh, I want to work with James Cameron for three years and, and look at underwater fo footage. But at some point, it became just a job. And the rate went higher and higher, but the job became less and less about the art. And so one thing that I had to do is to do an adjustment and really figure out what it is that I'm passionate about and then try to put myself in a position where I can develop stories that I'm passionate about. So I stepped away from that for a while. I was doing a lot of television and then stopped. And doing the channel actually sort of reignited that passion um, to become a storyteller. And doing a lot of indie projects helps, helps as well. So um, the challenge really is to do stuff that you're really passionate about because that's the only way that you're going to have the energy to keep doing and creating a lot of work. Um, Robert Hardy, a film blogger and independent filmmaker, uh, recently wrote, successful filmmakers know exact, exactly where they want to go in their career. There's no ambiguity, just clarity in which direction they want to travel. They understand that getting ahead requires prioritizing certain types of work over others. And better yet, they know which specific work to prioritize based on their career goals. And most importantly, they're committing taking consistent, focused action to move themselves in the direction of their goals. And that is something that really took me 10 years or more to really realize is that as a storyteller, as an editor, making those choices are far more important than um, trying to advance your career and moving up to the next pay grade. Um, and it's really about passion. So. How much time do I have? Another three minutes? Six minutes. Okay, great. Then I'm going to end this with a video that I recently did that I'm actually really passionate about. It's the Picasso one. Um, that so really, just because I heard something that inspired it, and then I'm like, oh, this is a real cool story. I want to I wanna talk about this. And um, this is sort of where the channel is. Uh, today in terms of the kind of programming that I'm really interested and intrigued by. Have you ever thought, no big deal, any child can paint like this? What makes this so special? Pablo Picasso took an axe to conventional art and hacked it into pieces. He reinvented a medium that's been trotting along for 600 years and turned it upside down. In this video, I'm going to attempt to look at Picasso's work in a different way. What can we learn from him and apply to filmmaking? This video is brought to you by PremiumBeat.com, exclusive royalty-free music for film and video. Maybe this is what little Pablo's first scribble would have looked like when he was a toddler. We do know that he painted this when he was eight. In his teens, he could pretty much make a carbon copy of any classic. He went to here, then here, already a rock star of his time, and then came this. Something radically new. Modern art. Uh, Sven, seriously, how does this relate to filmmaking? Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. said, I would not give a fig for the simplicity this side of complexity, but I would give my life for the simplicity on the other side of complexity. Picasso got there. Simple, complex, the far end of simplicity, where it's not about capturing reality, but the essence of everything. We started this conversation anyhow. 
you might have heard the saying, editing is cutting out the bad parts. Yes, you did. You just don't remember. That's certainly part of it. But on the far end of simplicity, there is far more to it than that. You think we can do this? What a stupid conversation. Stanley, please, I'm trying to get this done. Let's take a closer look at a Picasso. Without knowing anything about the painting, you see multi-facets to the face. You see her side, while you also see her straight on. We see this woman hugging this mirror. The right side is a reflection of how she sees herself. And everything is darkened, somewhat sad. She might even be crying. So we see angles that in reality aren't there. He wants to capture an emotion that you can take in even if you know nothing about the painting. Just like the essence of perfume, it's all around you. Tell me why, Graham. Great filmmaking can have that same effect. Sometimes, when you get a really good artist and a compelling story, you can almost achieve that thing that's impossible, which is entering the consciousness of another human being. For me, Picasso is a visual translation of that concept. Why? Because he dared to draw outside the line after mastering to stay within it. Listen, if there's one surefire rule that I have learned in this business is that I don't know anything about human nature. I don't know anything about curiosity. I don't, that's not part of what I do. What I, this is my business. And when I'm... Huh, Sven, how can I apply any of this to my own filmmaking? Well, here's a scene that I cut in a very conventional way. And then I picasso it up. So, what's the day? What's that? It's clean outside. Let me check and make sure it's clean outside. Yeah, I've been fucked since my early days. I've been stuck in my worldly ways. Propaganda press band. That means I focus just on the emotional impact of the scene. I'm going to take all the air out by throwing the edits. I'm basically letting the motion in the shot determine the cut. If you want to watch me actually edit that scene, I leave a link in the video description so that you can watch it on Patreon. But here are three more things you can take away from Picasso. Number one, Picasso created over 43,000 works of art, more than any other artist on record. Success requires action. So make a film, fail, do it again and fail harder. Number two, don't be afraid to embrace your inner child. It keeps you from overthinking things and encourages you to take risks. Number three, be open to copy, steal and remix. But to be truly innovative, you need to put your own spin on things. Picasso knew art. He tore it apart and put it back together in a new way. On the other side of complexity, it may just be as simple as that. I'd like to give a shout out to the sponsor of this video, premiumbeat.com. Next time you need production music for your projects, go pay them a visit. They're a great source of royalty free music. Thanks for watching. So, in conclusion, thank you. Being an audiovisual artist means being an editor. Being passionate means pursuing authentic personal challenges, and that will hopefully allow you to do a ton of work and bring up your storytelling skills. Thanks so much.